and welcome to this Year 9 lesson, Germany 1923, the Year of Crisis, Part 2. You will need with you for this lesson the lesson notes template that you will find on class charts, or you will have been emailed it directly, or failing that, you will find it in a link to the description at the, in the description at the bottom of this video. So, this lesson is going to focus on the political fallout of the crisis in Germany in 1923, and it is going to look at the impact that this had on the Nazi party, both in the short term and in the long term. So, let's get started. Okay, so I'm going to start with a bit of a recap from the last lesson, part one of the Germany 1923 crisis lesson. Um, you see some children here cutting up some paper, just doing a little bit of arts and crafts with thousands of um, Deutsch marks. So, what you are going to do is to do some recall of the key causes and consequences of the hyperinflation crisis from last lesson. So you're going to pause this, you're going to jot down all the causes of the hyperinflation crisis you can remember, and you're going to jot down all the consequences. Don't cheat by looking back at last lesson or looking further ahead in this booklet to see if you can, in the booklet to see if you can find any answers. Just try and do it from memory first of all. So pause this, off you go. Okay, welcome back. You will find on page three of your lesson notes template this document here, which talks to you about mainly the causes of the inflationary crisis. And we can see that Germany was faced with a, the government was faced with a decision after the First World War do you cut the spending on things and raise taxes, and that would keep inflation low? Or do you borrow money, print money, um, and keep the spending, which would lead to inflation? That's what they did. By 1923, inflation had reached levels that the whole economy was disrupted. Why did this happen? Well, that links then to the French occupation of the Ruhr and the government's response to that by telling people to go to work and you're sorry to stay off work as passive resistance and you'll still get paid. And the printing of more and more and more and more money that led to the hyperinflation crisis in 1923. So that's the causes. We know that the consequences economically for people who had savings were terrible. The poorest were hardest hit. We know that if you had land, property, and you were rich, then you weren't quite as badly hit. If you were paying off a debt, then you were um, you had a mortgage or a loan, then that was quite beneficial to you. The hyperinflation crisis. The more important longer term effect was the political consequence. The government's handling of the crisis made them seem weak. It eroded trust in the government and it made people feel as though they were not in control of the situation and it gave rise to extremist parties like the Nazis becoming more prominent as people looked to some radical solutions to the problems that were facing Germany in 1923. And that is what brings us to the next step of this lesson, which is about the rise of the Nazi party and their response to the inflationary crisis of 1923. Okay, if you turn to the fourth page of your lesson notes booklet, you will find that task two is about the early Nazi party and their key ideas. So this task is about identifying what the Nazis believed, what the role of Hitler was, why Hitler was so personally popular and was so appealing to many people at this time. So think about the context of the Weimar Republic, think about people's distrust of democracy, people's upset at the end of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles. That provides the context for the Nazis' political appeal. You're going to watch a short video clip in a moment, 
which talks about the Nazi appeal. And then you are going to read the information on pages four and five in your lesson notes booklet. And you are going to make the notes in response to the questions. What were the Nazis early ideas and why was Hitler so personally popular? When the armistice was signed to end the First World War, Hitler was lying in a hospital bed. He had been blinded by a gas attack. Like many soldiers, he was horrified to hear that the war was over. He felt stabbed in the back by the government back home in Germany. He was then sent on a special assignment by the army to spy on extreme fringe political groups. One of these groups, Hitler, ended up joining the Nazi party. He was instrumental in helping to draft their manifesto in 1920. The party was extremely right-wing, nationalistic, wanted to deny citizenship to Jews, wanted to destroy the Treaty of Versailles and return Germany to its former greatness. Hitler was joined in the party by many other disaffected, disillusioned young army men who wanted to tear down democracy and bring authoritarian government back to Germany. Many of these young men joined what Hitler created, which was the Storm Troopers, or SA, Storm Abteilung. These brown-shirted political thugs were used to protect Nazi party meetings, to beat up the Nazis' opponents, and to project a sense of military strength from the Nazi party. The Nazi party in this period really was a home for disillusioned young men. They appealed to this nationalistic sense that many German soldiers had, that somehow their country had been betrayed, that politicians had ended the war too early. It was amongst these people that the Nazis got support, but it was also amongst these people that many ultra right wing parties gained traction in this period. Okay, so pause now, read the information, use what you've just seen and that information to answer the questions on page four and five. So, you can see in terms of the key ideas of Hitler and the Nazis, the Nazis were a very nationalistic party. They didn't like uh, democracy, they wanted to return to the proud days of the German Reich, they didn't like the idea that the Kaiser had gone, they were thought democracy was weak, they thought the constitution was weak, they were obviously anti-Semitic, they believed in making Germany a stronger country. They believed in going against the Treaty of Versailles. They believed in a t return to traditional values for, for Germany. So we can see from the extracts from the 25-point party programme published in 1920, um, xenophobic ideas about only those of German blood can be members of the nation. Um, it's a, it, it talks about the state promoting the, the livelihood for its citizens. They want the land back from the Treaty of Versailles. They want it used for the common good of the people. So it's a very populist, nationalist ideas that the Nazis had. If we consider why Hitler himself was so personally popular, well, largely because of his charismatic speaking abilities. He he rehearsed his speeches, he rehearsed his gestures, um, he had publicity photos and paintings produced, he crafted a certain image of himself, and he was a very dominant personality, and 
He was very forceful with his ideas. He didn't tolerate people who disagreed with him. And this made him appear to be a very strong leader, appear to be a very charismatic and um, appealing leader. That's why he was so popular. So the, the early Nazi party really revolved around Hitler. Without Hitler as the focal point, the Nazi party would have been just one of lots of right-wing organizations that were against the Treaty of Versailles and didn't like how the First World War had ended for Germany. Okay, we're going to move on now to page six and task three, your lesson notes template, which is about the Munich Putsch. Putsch means a takeover, attempt to overthrow power, take, take over the government. And this guy here in front of you is Gustav Stresemann. Gustav Stresemann became Chancellor of Germany at the height of the hyperinflation crisis. And he tried to solve the crisis. And he was largely effective. He collected, he got people to collect in all the old money. He destroyed that currency and replaced it with a new currency, which was more stable. And he also called off the passive resistance against the French, began to co cooperate and negotiate with the French in order to try and end the crisis. And many people, including Hitler and the Nazis, were not happy with this. And this sparked a political reaction, which was part of this crisis of 1923 for Germany. OK, so you can see task three here. This it looks at the cause of the Munich Putsch. And you can see there are some long term causes. This is the, the long term frustration at the Treaty of Versailles and the end of the war and the things that people were frustrated about. Some medium term causes. Um, about the influence of the Nazis um, in terms of how they were influenced by what happened in Italy with Mussolini and feeling as though they wanted to emulate what went on there. And then you've got some short term causes, which is this hyperinflation crisis and the way that it was solved by the government and the way that they felt as though the government had caved into the French and it stopped resistance. So long term medium term and short term reasons why the Nazis decided they were going to try and take over the Munich government, this Munich putsch of 1923, this attempt to overthrow the Munich government. And then what they were going to try and do from there was go ahead and take over the government of Germany in Berlin as well. So you can see you've got a little table on page seven. Short term, medium term, long term, just jot down from the previous page what the key causes were. Again, if you haven't printed this booklet out or you're not filling it in electronically, it's absolutely fine for you to be making notes on line paper in your own on your own paper, on your own little notepad. It doesn't matter where you have the notes, whether they're electronic, whether it's a printed version of this or whether you've written them down, as long as you've got them, that's the important thing. So have a go at doing that, and then we'll come back and develop this a little bit further. OK, so task four on page eight of your booklet talks you through some steps to try and answer this question. We know that Hitler tried to overthrow the government in Munich because he was annoyed about the Treaty of Versailles and he was annoyed about the hyperinflation crisis and how it was being solved. But why did that Munich putsch fail? So that's the question. Follow the steps that start on page eight. And the first step in order to answer this question is to watch this little clip here. From 1920 to 1923, the Nazis remained one of what were many ultra right wing fringe extremist parties. This all changed in 1923. Furious at the Weimar government's decision to call off passive resistance and to give in to what he saw as the French illegal invasion of the Ruhr, Hitler and the Nazis decided to act. They hatched a plan to overthrow the government of Munich and then the Weimar Republic as a whole. Bursting into a beer hall, they held the Bavarian Prime Minister Gustav Kahr at gunpoint until he agreed to join their putsch. 
However, the Nazis made a fatal error. When Karl left the beer hall, having never been fully committed to the putsch, he communicated with the Weimar government exactly what Hitler was planning. A deal was cut whereby left-wing governments in other parts of the Weimar Republic would be replaced and removed, and in return, Carr and the army would help to face down Hitler's right-wing challenge. The next day, the Nazis and Hitler marched across Munich, but the police were waiting. Shots were fired, Hitler was pushed to the ground, injured his shoulder, escaped, but was later arrested. The putsch had failed completely. From the very beginning, this putsch was doomed to failure. It was poorly planned, and Hitler had seriously misjudged the mood of the Bavarian government. Not only that, he had misjudged the mood of many Germans at this time. The hyperinflation crisis was being solved. The German people were looking forward to a calmer political and economic situation. Okay, so you need to pause this now. The next step is to read the short bit of information, that's step two, on page eight. And then on page nine, step three, there is some more detailed information to read. And then on page 10, you need to try and write why the push failed. Okay, so what you should have got from that material um, in answer to the question why the putsch failed, it failed for several reasons. It failed because it was very poorly planned in the sense that um, Hitler's belief that he was going to get the support of the Bavarian government was misguided because he only got Gustav Karl, the head of the Bavarian government, to agree to him with a gun pointed to his head. And once the gun was no longer pointed at his head, he rang up the Weimar government and said, by the way, this is what's going to happen. The, the Nazis seriously misjudged the mood of the people. The people weren't ready to join with them in some sort of spontaneous uprising. People were just relieved that the government was sorting out the hyperinflation crisis. They weren't ready to, to rise up against the government. And the Weimar government was ready for this sort of um, protest, thanks to Carr warning them. And the deal that they did to remove some left-wing governments in other parts of the country appeased um, some people who might have sympathised with the Nazis and that's why they didn't end up rising up and supporting them. So the whole thing was a mess, the whole thing was poorly organised. Um, Hitler ended up being arrested after being injured um, and the whole thing failed disastrously uh, for those reasons. However, what we're now going to do is look at the extent to which this failure was a short term or a long term failure, because the story of the Munich Putsch is a little bit more complex. So if you look at page 11 of your lesson notes template, you will find task five, which says Munich Putsch. Consequences? A total failure? Question mark. And you will see there's some information here about the consequences. So we know that Hitler was found guilty of treason. We know that Ludendorff was found guilty of treason. We know the Nazi party was banned. So in the short term, we could say the Munich Putsch was a pretty, a pretty humiliating failure if the whole of the Nazi party is actually banned. However, things are not quite that simple. Um, Hitler being put in prison and being put on trial before he was put in prison gave him a platform, a national platform, to be able to explain some of his ideas and it gave him the opportunity when he was in prison for only, only nine months, which is quite a short sentence that he served, to write his book Mein Kampf or My Struggle. So what you are going to do is use the information on the previous pages, so you're going to use this information here about the Munich Putsch um, that you looked at when you were looking at why it failed, 
and you're going to look at now failures and successes. So here is some here are some reasons why it failed. What I want you to do is to jot down either around this or on a separate piece of paper the evidence that supports these reasons for failure, but also some successes. I want you to jot down some of the knowledge in the previous pages that suggest how the Nazis might have developed some success from the Munich Putsch. So all you're doing is adding some some knowledge to these reasons for failure or reasons for success. And before you do that to help you, here's another video clip that talks about maybe the longer term success of the Munich Putsch for the Nazis, which will help you with the information about it being a success. After the disastrous failure of the Munich Putsch, Hitler was arrested and put on trial. He and his co-conspirators were charged with an attempt to overthrow the government. However, he used this trial as a platform from which to express his political ideas. And as the media became more and more interested in his words, he became something of a national celebrity. During the trial, Hitler argued that his act was not treasonous at all. In fact, his attempt to overthrow the government was an act of German heroism, an act of nationalism. It was the Weimar Republic and their government that were really treasonous. During the trial, Hitler wowed the watching galleries and media with his fiery oratory. This, coupled with a very sympathetic judge and jury, meant he only got nine months in Landsberg prison. A remarkably short period of time for a man who had tried to overthrow a democratically elected government. This prison was more of a right-wing holiday camp. Hitler was allowed to receive visitors, wander around the grounds, and he spent much of his time writing Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, his political testament in which he laid out his ideology and his hopes for the future of Germany. It was in Mein Kampf that Hitler really spelled out his vision for Germany, a very, very dark vision indeed, for many people who were not included in Hitler's idea of what Germany should be. In this book, he railed against communism and he railed against the Jews. He blamed all of the problems of the Weimar Republic on politicians and the Treaty of Versailles, which he said had to be destroyed if Germany was to be great again. During Hitler's time in prison, the Nazi party almost collapsed without his leadership. When he came out, he decided on a new strategy for the party of votes to not violence. Even though he detested Weimar democracy, he thought the Nazis needed to hold their noses, as he said, and try and campaign for votes alongside other political parties. These years in the mid-1920s were characterised by the Nazis developing something of a political machine, trying to set up headquarters and party establishment in different parts of Germany. In okay, so taking some material from the video that you've just watched there and uh, from that information that is included in your lesson notes template, pause now and try and jot down some evidence to support the idea that it was a failure that goes alongside those points that you've been given and some evidence that suggests it was a success that goes alongside those points that you've already been given.
Okay, so that brings us to the end of this lesson on 1923, the year of crisis in Germany. And we can see that this crisis was both economic and it was political. In part one of this lesson on Germany in 1923, we saw the impact of hyperinflation, the impact that had on people's lives, people's trust in the government. Um, but we've seen in this lesson the political impact of that also. So we can argue that the short term cause of the Munich Putsch was in fact the Nazis outrage at the end of hyperinflation and although that was a that putsch was a failure and in the short term it was a humiliation for Hitler in the longer term it enabled the Nazis to begin to think about a change in their tactics it brought Hitler to national attention it enabled him to write his memoir which allowed him to set out his ideas and it further destabilized people's trust, faith in the Weimar government that was seen as unstable and weak. So this year of 1923 is particularly tumultuous in Germany um, and it lays the foundations for the Nazi party to try and develop some sort of national organization during the 1920s. However, this year of crisis in 1923 also really signals the end of the first part of our study of the Weimar Republic. And this is the last crisis of many crises that Germany faced in the period 1918 to 23. So far from this being the, the sort of final crisis that brought the Weimar Republic down, this crisis actually, although it had important economic and political consequences, was not by any means the most significant crisis that Germany faced in the period 1918 to 23, and it was not, as we are going to see, the beginning of the end for the Weimar Republic. In fact, The reality is that 1923 was a year when Germany overcame the crisis of the hyperinflation and the crisis of the Munich Putsch, which eventually laid a bit of a platform for a more prosperous period in the Weimar Republic. And Gustav Stresemann's ability to overcome the hyperinflation crisis the banning of the Nazi party, Hitler being sent to prison, was the beginning of a more prosperous and hopeful period for the Weimar Republic. And so that brings us to the end of this part two, Year 9 Lesson, Germany 1923, Year of Crisis. Next time we will pick up the story of the Weimar Republic in what many have termed the golden years of the mid-1920s, and see how the Weimar Republic began to recover, began to improve in that period. So, until next time, take care, stay safe, goodbye.